Um, Dr. Levin has another group of cells that he's made from some Australian patients, and we will work together to test these drugs to see which one is best. Now, you might be asking, how many patients is this going to help? It depends on the disease, but I can tell you this, that we can use one drug to treat people with 2,000 different genetic diseases. Now, they won't all be the same in their response, and it may be advisable to use the drug, it may not be. Those are all questions that we are working out. But that concept of having a nonsense mutation and using a smart drug to correct it applies to all genetic disease, not just to AT. This is a big advantage for trying to get a company to come up with $300 million. They won't do it for AT, but they will do it if they think there is a large enough market, and we'll come back to that. Now, this is the work on um, not only AT. Here you see the correction. Here the AT cells not making this correction of DNA, but you see here that if you add the drug, they begin to look like the normal cells, and they are restored in their function. This is muscular dystrophy now, a very different disease, same drug. Uh, this is one that was on the market that has recently, the, not on the market, but it was approved for clinical trials, but uh, it has been discontinued for trials on muscular dystrophy. It's still being tested for cystic fibrosis. Here is the smart drug we were using in these experiments, and if the lights were low, you would see that the return of this normal um, dystrophin is the protein that holds the muscles together in muscular dystrophy, and uh, this drug was doing uh, something to correct this, but not enough, and uh, this smart drug that we're using actually um, is certainly giving pretty pictures. Now, we haven't tested it on the patients. We've only tested it uh, in the mice. This is epidermolysis bullosum. The photograph is so terrible of an infant with blisters all over that I, I decided to delete it. It's good for medical uh, audiences, but not necessarily for uh, other people. And uh, these are some of the mutations. This is another very big gene. So far, the three genes we've talked about, ataxia, ATM, muscular dystrophy, and this is collagen 7, are some of the biggest genes known. We should be working with smaller genes. The work would be easier, but uh, for various reasons, we have come to work on these. And uh, these are all stop codons, and uh, we've tested most of these with some of these drugs, and the drugs do, uh, they restore the collagen 7 protein, so they should work in the uh, infants with epidermolysis bullosum. Um, here are the, uh, the, RT, the 13 and 14 group that we've been looking at, and this is one of that BZ group, and here is the one that was on the market uh, that, that is still being tested for cystic fibrosis, and you can see that these drugs, I don't know if you can see from there, but uh, you, you can see, if you can see, uh, these are higher and the results are better. They look more like these. Now you may wonder, well, why aren't we using these drugs? Well, this again is the gentamicin, uh, that doesn't go through the blood-brain barrier. And this is another drug very similar that also uh, doesn't go through the blood-brain barrier. It's also very toxic, so you, you cannot use those drugs. But you can see the function returning here for RTC14, which is down here, and uh, for uh, BZ6. So there is hope that this uh, will work. We've actually put Z BZ16, I'm sorry, BZ16 into mice and uh, it's tolerated quite well. So that looks promising. So we go back to the businessmen, and we go back to the, the marketing opportunities. Uh, and we have then, if they look at this, they see that uh, ataxia is, uh, it's, it's not an inconsequential market, that's $90 million, but it's not enough for them to commit uh, uh, $300 million to the development. Um, 
But this disease, Hurler's disease, is not much bigger, but 70% of the patients carry nonsense mutations. So they would all be, well, 70% would be candidates for these drugs. Um, about 30% of the AT patients. Uh, this is muscular dystrophy. It's a, it's a bigger market, uh, but fewer mutations and that's the way they calculate the market share. Cystic fibrosis, we haven't really worked with. We don't know if that would work. But I think you can begin to see how we are trying to build an argument for developing this drug, not for AT, but for many diseases. And we, of course, know that the, our main purpose is for AT. All of this work was started specifically to help AT patients. The other diseases will benefit from our treatment. Now, another thing to keep in mind is that when these go into the various phases of testing for safety, first you test for safety, then you test to see if it's effective, and then you go back and do a whole study blind to see if you get good, re good uh, um, results with patients uh, with various types of symptoms. But for every patient you put into this study, uh, it's $36,000. Now I'm going to show you one or two more slides, and one of those slides talks about orphan disease trials. We've tried to point out to the companies that are looking at this technology that orphan diseases uh, need a smaller commitment of patients. They can do the studies for licensing on 30, 40 patients instead of 2,000 patients for uh, other types of medications. So uh, the numbers here w will be 23 patients, 40 patients, instead of 2,000. And this comes out to the difference between um, maybe um, 2 million instead would be 200 million. So it, it makes a big difference to them, and that's the argument we're trying to build. Now these are the various steps that needs to be, need to be taken to launch this drug onto the market. Uh, we're in the discovery and the preclinical phase. We're right here. Um, but you can see how much money is involved. So there are no uh, organizations or um, uh, funding agencies that will give you this kind of money. Most of them don't have this much money in their annual budget. So we really have to do this with uh, a pharmaceutical company that will take an interest in this. Here's the slide I was telling you about. Um, if you look here in, these, in this box, an orphan disease needs uh, for phase one 20 to 80 healthy disease uh, individuals, and that can be done with uh, even non-healthy individuals. They will allow you to do that under certain circumstances that makes the, uh, the clinical trial much simpler as opposed to, well, uh, and looking here is a study size of 20 versus several hundred patients. So there is a lot of money to be saved in bringing a drug to market for an orphan disease. They are, it also gives, in the United States, it gives the company an extra seven years of protection from competitors which is a big advantage to them. In seven years, they will make back that the $300 million uh, plus uh, $3 billion. Uh, there are really great profits in a drug once it reaches the market, but it has to stay on the market in order to get back those profits. And I think this is my last slide. These are some of the risk factors. Um, I don't want to sound too optimistic. Um, we're, we're going along as fast as we can, but you see it's a very complicated problem, and uh, it's complicated also by the finances. Um, it's capital intensive. The uh, regulatory approval is grueling. Uh, this drug has to work, and before that, it has to be absolutely effective. If, the, if there are any problems, they basically send you back to go, and you start again. And you go back, and what do you do? You look at one of the uh, other compounds in the same group, perhaps. But you have to start again. So you don't really want to make that mistake. It's a very costly mistake. And then, of course, as we move from country to country, 
we have to look at the regulations for each of those countries. So it's a very complicated process. Uh, I am not Yossi Shalom, but I think it looks like he may be next. So I'll, uh, I'll thank you for your attention.